Karen was wondering on the way to church, she said, what are you talking about? A cold confession. And that's because today I'm going to be making a cold confession. Uh, I'm going to be sharing something very personal with you and making a confession. You've heard it said before, confession is good for the soul but very bad for the reputation. And that may be the case today. But um, your pastor was addicted and involved in substance abuse for over 30 years. Yeah, I guess they got the substance there on the screen right now. <laughs> now, you think I'm kidding. Some of this may be a little bit tongue in cheek, but there is a point. But I had a very serious problem with an addiction to ice cream. Now, when I get done, you describe, you, you let me know what you think that if it fits the definition. Now, I don't know exactly when it began, but I know it started a long time ago. And um, my substance abuse started innocently enough, and I want to make it clear right from the beginning, I am not saying that ice cream is a sin. Is that clear? But it got to the place where it was for me. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, therefore whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. And I certainly was not doing it to the glory of God. Now, I don't know if any of you remember a day where years ago they had an ice cream man that would go up and down the neighborhood and a bell would ring and a song would play. I don't remember what the song is. Anyone remember the Good Humor Man? Yes. Do you have happy memories on those hot summer days and you'd hear that music? It was like the gates of heaven had opened up, <laughs> right? And you'd hear that music playing and this little white truck would come out and all the kids would crowd into certain set spots in the street and just about throw themselves in front of this vehicle and um, he would step out and usually he was friendly and uh, he, there in the truck he had his dried ice. It was always so amazing to me. He showed me a piece of the dried ice and, and uh, the, the fog billowing out and he'd pull out these exotic treats and I remember some of my favorites were, they had one called a rainbow rocket. It was a double popsicle. It had two sticks that went up through it. You could break it in half and share it with a friend. So I often would split a rainbow rocket I'm sure it was full of colors and chemicals and things, but it, it was delicious. It's probably all corn syrup. They had another one that was orange with vanilla inside. It was an orange popsicle with vanilla. Anyone? They still make those. Do you know they still have ice cream trucks in some neighborhoods in Sacramento? Have you heard them? And the thing that's so funny, I remember I was at Bonnie's house not long ago, and I heard one coming around the neighborhood and he was playing the song which is Little Brown Jug. <laughs> Any of you know what I'm talking about a little? Ha 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 he he Little Brown Jug how I love thee which is about a jug of whiskey. I thought what kind of song is that for kids? <laughs> Come right there you know there's an addiction issue connected with this. So they still have dealers that go through the neighborhood but it goes way back and I remember that I, it was so important to me I couldn't understand why my grandmother would not give me 10 or 25 cents, that's all it was back then, every day. And she said, it's a treat, you can't have it every day. And I'm ashamed to tell you that I vividly remember stealing money from my grandmother. She, this is one of my earliest memories, she hung her black leather purse over the doorknob of her bedroom and inside her purse she had another little purse that had one of those very difficult snaps on it that you had to twist. It was the change purse. And she caught me one day. I don't know how many times I did it, but more than once. That's where my life of crime began. It was for ice cream money. <laughs> you see. And uh, yeah, I, my grandmother was tough. I remember sticking out my tongue one time and she said, boy, you got such a pretty tongue, do that again. <laughs> I stuck out my tongue and she slapped me underneath my chin and made me bite down on my tongue, which really hurt. 
And I never forgot that, and I never stuck out my tongue at my grandmother again, but my grandmother was pretty tough. Anyway, she caught me stealing, that's all I'm gonna say about that. But it was for ice cream money. Well, I took my, it, it was just, you know, a, it was a, a small obsession at that point. When I got to New York City, parents divorced, and uh, maybe I was looking for comfort, but uh, one of the highlights of the day was when I would snuggle up with my mother and my brother and we would eat ice cream and watch the wonderful world of Disney or uh, the Ed Sullivan Show or some one of those programs. We only had three channels back then. We had the coat hanger on top of the TV with the tin foil to improve reception in our apartment. Anyone remember? And then when I went to live with dad, oh, I, there was a spell also at military school. Even in military school, I remember that um, once a week we did ice cream and I look forward to that day. And it came wrapped up and it was Neapolitan. It was an ice cream sandwich with chocolate, strawberry and vanilla in it. And I would relish that. I would beg and bribe the other cadets if I could get their sandwich. I'd give them any of the food they wanted on my plate if I could get their ice cream. And then I went to live with dad, and that's when it really started to get serious, is uh, in Florida, we actually had, I know you don't think of Miami Beach having milkmen, but we had a milkman. And I looked it up online to see they're still in business. The company was called MacArthur Dairy. And they would bring the milk to the door, and my stepmother would fill out a, um, a form, and it wasn't every day, but like every other day, he, he would bring the order. But this was really neat. In Miami Beach, the milkmen not only brought milk, they brought fresh squeezed Tropicana orange juice in, in a jar, a glass jar. And they would squeeze it that day and, and you'd get fresh orange juice and they brought ice cream. Now we always knew when he was coming because you can't leave your ice cream out on the porch for very long. And um, you know, I didn't, uh, I was living with my dad and my stepmother and my stepbrother. My brother was sick and I was struggling during those years. And one of the treats for me was I would take a half a pint of ice cream and pour in Tropicana orange juice and mix it all. It reminded me of those orange things the good humor man had. It was really good. But it got to where my stepmother started saying, who ate all the ice cream? because I was eating all of the ice cream. I mean, I started doing it every day. And I really enjoyed it. It was the highlight of my day. But then things really turned from bad to worse because summer came and I needed to find a job. And guess where I got a job? I got a job working at Baskin Robbins. Karen and I were in Miami Beach not too long ago, I took her by, tried to find where the old ice cream shop was, and I guess it's not there anymore, in Lincoln Mall. But I worked at 31 Flavors, and the owner was Lee Scott. And I remember when he hired me, I was only like 14, 15 years old. He really liked me because I'd been to military school and I was a cleaning fanatic. And I kept the store clean, and he had this waxing machine and none of the kids knew how to use the waxing machine. You know those floor buffers? You know how to use one of those, you can really get hurt. But we used them in military school. I said, oh yeah, I can use And so I would buff and wax the floor and everything was just spick and span. And I said, when he was hiring me, I said, now, I'm just wondering, are we allowed to eat the product? <laughs> he said, no problem. He says, you can eat as much as you want, you'll get tired of it. I never even got close to getting tired of it. <laughs> he had, now you know Baskin Robbins is called 31, not because they've got 31 flavors. They guarantee having 31 flavors in the store at any given time. They have hundreds of flavors and we had new flavors rotating in all the time. And I'm not kidding you, I would eat a pralines and cream banana split for lunch and then I'd have a hot fudge mocha sundae for dinner, and it's amazing when you're a teenager what you can do to yourself. <laughs> and you feel indestructible, but I really was, it was getting bad. I mean, I ate a lot of ice cream. And the problem was I was not only now a user, I was a dealer. Because <laughs> people were coming in and now I'm selling it. And 
Sometimes people would come in for ice cream cakes for a birthday party. And I remember Mr. Scott one day, he said, Doug, he said, why don't you try, you know, you, you personalize the top of the cake and you write on it. And I was no good at that. Uh, any of you ever seen my handwriting? People would come to pick up their ice cream birthday cakes and they'd go, what does that say? <laughs> I says, happy birthday, William, can't you read it? <laughs> And you have to squeeze the stuff out of a tube and while you're writing it was, I wasn't any good at that. But I worked there until I ran away from home. And um, then it was hit and miss on the road for a little while with ice cream. But uh, even when I moved up into the mountains in a cave, um, no refrigeration obviously, uh, it very long way to town, grueling hike, but it was the desert. Back then, they had Thrifty's drugstores everywhere. I don't see Thrifty's drugstore is evidently out of business. I don't know if you can still get Thrifty's ice cream, but in all their drugstores, they had an ice cream counter. Do you remember? Well, I'm not kidding. Do any of you remember when it was a nickel a scoop? And you could get a triple scoop for 15 cents. Go try and find that. But when you're living in a cave in a desert and you've got no refrigeration, the highlight for me was to go panhandle and see if I could get 15 cents. I would beg on the street and say, could I please have 15 cents for something to eat? I didn't tell them what I was going to eat. But it's true, I would spend my last 15 cents on ice cream. And I remember, um, I wasn't the only one, a lot of the street people, it was a big deal. And there were others that were living in the desert. Most of them lived in the first valley. I live way back in, in the canyon. And I remember I was hanging out on the street one day with my friends and some kid had walked out of Thrifty's with a triple scoop of ice cream and he wasn't paying attention and the ice cream guy at the counter, you know, when, at Thrifty's when you got your ice cream, the same guy that worked the cash register, he worked the counter and he didn't always know what to do with ice cream. And so he didn't press, that first scoop has to get pressed down into the cone or it can become detached. And he had a triple scoop and this kid walked out on the street and he turned and the thing fell off the cone. But it landed, not flat, it landed still intact with three scoops. I kind of reproduced that, that's a little bit of Photoshop. <laughs> but it looked like that. It landed three scoops like the tower pieces sticking straight up. And the kid began to cry and the parents, oh come on in, we'll get you another one. And they walked in the store. I'm standing there with my friends <laughs> and we're looking at that. And I said, you know, only part of that hit the ground. Kid didn't even lick it yet. And if he did lick it, the part he licked is the part on the ground. The other stuff is still good. And while we were processing that, before I could act on my thought, my friend Richie got down on all fours and he began to eat the ice cream <laughs> off the street like that. Really, I didn't do it. But I thought about it because I thought, that's some perfectly good ice cream that's going to waste right now. And I was mad that Richie did it first. <laughs> because I, I really had it pretty bad. And uh, I wouldn't just eat one triple thing of ice cream. I would eat one when I arrived at town and then later in the day I'd get another one before I went up the hill. And that would have to last me. You know, I used to wonder why was it so important to me? And I later found that there was a study. Believe it or not, there's medical research. Journal of Clinical Investigation. This is a study done in 2011 a team of researchers led by Lucas van Andenhove, University of Belgium. They were publishing images of brain activity during times of sadness and they had 12 volunteers that had their brains scanned with an MRI and also agreed to have a feeding tube put into their stomach. Then they were shown images and played some neutral or sad music and shown neutral or sad images and then they would rate how they felt on a scale of one to nine and when they were feeling sad, they would then inject in their stomachs a solution. Some of them got a salt solution. They didn't know what was going in their stomach. Some of them would get a fat solution that would be similar to what you would find in ice cream. And then they would evaluate them afterward and they found out in almost every case, those who were sad after being given the fatty solution, it says the effect was significant 
in a pharmacological sense, the fatty solution reduced the intensity of sad emotions by almost half, which is about as much as any prescription antidepressant can achieve. And so you were wondering why you thought ice cream was comfort food. They've finally done research to say that it actually does work as an antidepressant. So I guess you could say I was addicted to antidepressants. <laughs> but it came in the form of haagen -Dazs. <laughs> And it was pretty serious. Now you think I jest. You know the Bible says that um, a little bit of certain things is okay but something can be taken to an extreme and it becomes sin. Ecclesiastes 10:17. Blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. I mean, it was to excess with me. And then even when I moved out of the cave, I lived for a while, I had a meat business, lived in Palm Springs. I am not kidding you, I would eat ice cream every night and I would more than once eat a half a quart. Once I ate a whole quart, I stayed up late and I listened to Cal Worthington commercials on a little black and white TV. <laughs> Any of you know who that was? Cal, Cal Worthington? Go see Cal. Now that is depressing, isn't it? But you know, when you're like 19, 20 years old, it's amazing how much you can eat. Karen and I can't believe it now that both the boys are gone to college. We open the refrigerator, there's still food <laughs> in the refrigerator. <laughs> it's amazing. But I mean, I really was, I had a problem. And then even after I moved into the hills in Covalo and I got baptized, this is when it, I think, got really serious. Um, you know, when you give up your addictions and you only got a few left, you overcompensate. And as I gave up the drugs and the smoking and the drinking, all I had left was the ice cream. Then you really go overboard. And I remember living up in Covalo. I would quote the Bible and I'd say, God is taking us to a land flowing with milk and honey. God believes in ice cream. <laughs> this is heavenly food. I mean, why would he say that he's going to take them to a land of milk and honey? And then I went to the store and I found haagen honey vanilla. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> this is biblical. And I had scripture for it. But... You know, there's a verse that says, if you found honey, Proverbs 25, 16, have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. Uh, some things that are good, that are meant to be a treat, that God would bless, you can do to excess. Now, this is a very important principle of what I'm sharing with you today. And I know you're laughing and I'm meaning for you too and some of what I'm saying is tongue in cheek but I'm sharing this odyssey with you because it relates to real life. What I'm sharing with you is true. I'm not making this up. I mean, I was addicted for years. I look back and it, it's just over there. My life was defined. I had my tonsils taken out when I was eight years old. My mother just couldn't figure, thought I had bad tonsils. I was just eating so much dairy I couldn't breathe. Didn't realize I was allergic to it. So uh, moved up in the hills, and even in Covalo, I would drive um, half an hour round trip to town. No, one hour round trip. One hour, half an hour each way. Thank you, dear. I've got a witness here. I had to get my ice cream. And, uh, and I'm ashamed to say that I think I also was influencing others. Even when Karen and I began to date, I'd uh, say, you want to split some ice cream? <laughs> and I'd get um, vanilla almond. And I'd eat Swiss vanilla Swiss almond. Yeah, I'd eat the ice cream. She'd eat the chocolate-covered almonds. <laughs> <laughs> I remember John Lomacane was really weird. You know, we'd be on the road doing evangelistic meetings. How about some ice cream, John? That was a bad influence. So we'd go get a, a pint of haagen and and we'd sit down, and usually we're in a hotel because we're doing meetings, and, and uh, I'd say, don't you want some? I'd say, no, just not yet. Yeah, I want some. Save me some. And so I'd, I'd eat it. I'd say, well, how much do you want? Well, just, you know, about half. Just save me some. So I'd eat mine. I'd say, don't you? 
I'd set it down. He waited till it melted. He liked it melted. Then he'd eat it. I had another friend when I'd be on the road. We'd take the haagen thing and we'd take a knife and he said, I'll split it with him. We'd just cut it in half. And someone would eat out of one half and someone would eat out of the others. But um, any of my friends that were close to me know at the end of the day, I went on a hunt. I went on a safari looking for ice cream. And I'd go a long way because uh, I, it, to me it represented comfort or something. I don't know. I couldn't stop. By the way, in spite of that verse that says he's bringing us to a land flowing with milk and honey, that doesn't mean God wanted us to mix it all together and eat it at once. In the book Councils on Diets and Food, it says, some use milk and a large amount of sugar on their mush, their cereal, their oatmeal, thinking that they're carrying out health reform, but the sugar and the milk combined are liable to cause fermentation in the stomach and thus harmful. Which means I probably went to bed drunk a lot from ice cream. And then I realized finally it had gone too far. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but um, when I traveled uh, and I stayed at a hotel, one of the first things I'd do is I'd find out where's a 7-Eleven because 7-Eleven carries haagen or Ben & Jerry's. Ben & Jerry's was not as good, but I always felt like I was supporting a couple of druggies with Ben & Jerry's, you know. They had ice cream called Cherry Garcia, named after the, yeah, anyway. So I'd go to a 7-Eleven, I'd look for one, and one time uh, when I was going to a hotel to do a meeting, and Bonnie said, well, they've got a shuttle that goes to the airport, I said, well, I'm going to need a rental car. Well, you won't need it. I said, well, you know, I might need to get something to eat, and well, you know what I was thinking? Hotel was too far away from ice cream. It was at this conference center. And I needed a car so I could get ice cream. And then when I realized that here I had rented a car and Amazing Facts supporters were paying for me to have a rental car so I could get ice cream, I felt guilty, and so I refunded the money, and it occurred to me that ice cream cost me $35 a pint. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it was that bad. Only once or twice did I order room service, $8 for ice cream, and then you want to tip the person who brings it, because I'd tell them, please hurry, because they bring it to you all melted, and then it's no good. And I realized this is just starting to, this has gone too far. I thought, I got a problem. And so I started praying about it. I said, Lord, I got to stop eating ice cream. I, certainly anything that is uh, preoccupying my day. You know, my father was an alcoholic, and I think I've got that nature. My father would plan his day around alcohol. When he made lunch appointments, he wouldn't just take a person to a restaurant because he liked the food. The restaurant had to first and foremost have alcohol. Then he'd figure out what else they had. And then after work, he'd stop at the bar. And if he went on vacation, it had to be somewhere where there was a bar. And if he went on a fishing trip or if he went racing or whatever he did, there was always the ice chest with alcohol. His whole life, that was just had to be there in the picture. And I was realizing ice cream was doing that to me. I'd get on TV in front of everybody, preach about the health message, do a back handspring, and then go home and eat a pint of haagen -Dazs. Yes, sometimes I'd eat a whole pint. The average American eats 42 pints of ice cream a year. I was eating about 120. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. And then I'd go to the doctor. He'd say, Doug, cholesterol looks good. Blood pressure okay. I'd say, not bothering me. And I had all these rationalizations. But I knew I was addicted. How do you know? Because I couldn't stop. I'd spend my last 15 cents on ice cream. I could tell you more stories, but I think you get the picture. Finally, I became convinced, all right, I got to do something about this. And then I went through a couple of years of a real struggle. I think I went through all of the throws and the twists and the turns of all kinds of addictions. I'd stop, I'd go a day or two, and I'd feel real good about it, and then I'd say, I'm under control now. I think I can just have a little bit. 
And I got to the point where instead of eating a pint a day, I got to where it was half a pint a day, and then I got down to a third. One little pint of haagen would last me three days, and I felt like I was doing pretty good. That went on for a couple of years. My Karen's here, she's not disagreeing with me. Bonnie would invite me over and offer dessert. She'd say, well, you got some ice cream? I'd say, no, thanks, because I had good stuff at home. <laughs> so I could turn it down as long as I knew I could have it before I went to bed. And it, for some reason, even if I ate late and I ate way too much, it always seemed I had room for ice cream. If I didn't have it, it was felt, I was like incomplete. <laughs> really, I don't know why. And then I got where I'd go a day or two without eating ice cream. I'd go to the market and, uh, oh boy, it would be a struggle. I'd say, Karen, I gotta go get some chips. <laughs> or all she knows, that's the other thing I'm addicted to, but that's under control, corn chips. <laughs> And salsa, I eat a lot of chips and salsa. And I, so I'd go get the chips, and then I'd go up and down the aisle, buy the frozen section, and look at it. <laughs> and I'd, I'd see it on sale. Normally it was almost $3 or more, and it would be two for $5. I'd go, Lord, it must be your will <laughs> today, because it's on sale. And then I figured I'm not going to buy it anymore unless it's on sale. That's how I grappled with my guilt. But when I bought it on sale, I bought enough to last until the next sale. <laughs> and then you know what made things difficult is one of the members of our church who might be here today, I don't want to point her out, worked at the supermarket where I shopped. Don't you love it when uh, the person who's checking you out at the market looks at what's in your shopping cart and says stuff like, Oh, somebody's got a sweet tooth. <laughs> they comment on what you're buying. <laughs> and she noticed several times I would be showing up 10 o'clock at night just for ice cream. And then I'd go to the store and I'd look for her. And I'd see she's down there. And I'd sneak around the aisles. <laughs> And I'd throw it in, and I'd look back and say, oh, she's helping somebody else. Go check out, self-check out, quick. <laughs> I was living a secret life. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So, I was a hypocrite. I'm preaching about the health message, and I was addicted to junk food. And I know it wasn't good for me, even though the Lord blessed me with a relatively good constitution. You know, Jesus talks about this where he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. In Luke 11, woe to you, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So I'd preach a sermon on gaining the victory over sin when I was a slave. Now, I, the reason I picked this subject, and I prayed about this, I, I think the Lord wanted me to talk to you about this. The reason I picked this subject, because this is at least something I can confess to you, and you're probably not going to get me fired. <laughs> but it was very real. I was addicted, and I was hiding it, and I was wasting money. It was expensive. Addiction. But little by little, any of you ever heard that song called Junk Food Junkie? Years ago, now this is going to date you if you know the words to this song. Years ago, a guy named Larry Grossi wrote a song about, uh, this was back when the hippies began to get into the health food movement, and any of you remember Yule Gibbons and the Nature Cereal? Yeah, okay. This guy wrote this song called Mr. Natural, and uh, it actually kind of relays the kind of hypocrisy that some people struggle with where you've got your public life and then you've got what's real. He said, you know that I love organic cooking, I always ask for more, and they call me Mr. Natural on down at the health food store. I only eat good sea salt, white sugar don't touch my lips, and my friends are always begging me to take them on macrobiotic trips. 
But at night I take out my strong box I keep under lock and key, and I take it off to my closet where no one else can see. I open the door so slowly, take a peek up north and south, and then I pull out a hostess Twinkie and I stuff it in my mouth. In the daytime I'm Mr. Natural, just as healthy as I can be, but at night I'm a junk food junkie. Dear Lord, have pity on me. And he's got several verses that tell a similar story about how all of his friends think he's so natural, but the last one is actually pretty good. He said, uh, Oh, folks, but lately I've been spotted with a Big Mac on my breath, stumbling into a Colonel Sanders with a face as white as death. I'm afraid someday they'll find me just stretched out on my bed with a handful of Pringles potato chips and a ding-dong by my head. <laughs> In the daytime, I'm Mr. Natural, just as healthy as I can be, but at night I'm a junk food junkie. You know what this is talking about? It's kind of living a double life. Now this plays itself out. I'm talking about a problem with ice cream. This plays itself out in a lot of different ways. You know, some of you are going to be really self-conscious if you invite Pastor Doug over and you have ice cream for dessert. Don't worry, I got the victory. Praise God. It's taken years, but I, I got the victory. I'm okay. I'm not saying ice cream is a sin. Shopping online is not a sin for everybody. But I know a pastor that he would get online and start buying stuff and he couldn't stop. And his house and his garage was filled with products that were not even opened that he bought impulsively either from shopping channel or some sale online and he had spent all of his money, all of his retirement and was deeply in debt. Now is there any sin in shopping online? I've done it this year. You can buy stuff. Sometimes you can save money. But some people can't. And you may have weaknesses and you think, well, this isn't so bad, but has it gotten too big for you? Is it taking over in your life? Is it something that's out of balance in your life? Something that you're maybe covering up? Now, I got so bad that I was on my knees, you would probably never think that someone would have to get on their knees and plead for the victory over ice cream. But I did. I finally said, Lord, I'd quit for a while and then I'd start again. I'd say, I've got it under control. Nothing's wrong with a little bit, but I couldn't handle a little bit. And I finally had to say, Lord, help me. And you know, it required human effort, but I believe God intervened. And as I made my efforts humanly, the Lord then takes it away. He gives you a supernatural power. You know, there's a statement to that effect. The divine combined with the human effort will give to all perfect and entire victory. Every believing mind will be filled with conscious power. The language of the soul will be, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now, I just want to tell you, in following up from my personal struggle, I know you think this is kind of strange, but there's a point to it. Um, I praise God. You might think it's odd, but I praise God because I was a slave. It controlled my time. It took my money. It, at the end of the day, it had to be part of my day. It was like I associated it with comfort. It was almost emotional, but I was addicted but the Lord took it away from me. It's been years now. Now I'm a vegan. Hey, what, can you imagine that? For years, I was using rice dream and almond milk and soy milk in my cereal and told everyone I'm a vegetarian, and I was, but at night, I was a glutton with ice cream. Daytime, I'm Mr. Natural. But you know what really happened, and one reason I'm so excited about this, when I finally went two weeks without eating ice cream, no dairy. I started realizing for the first time in my life I was breathing. I'm not exaggerating. I didn't know I had an allergy to milk. So this is not religious. This is, I'm just telling you me. I, Karen still eats dairy and the kids. It's, I'm not talking about it's being something religious. All my life I was allergic to milk and I didn't know it and I could not breathe the way normal people breathe, and I didn't know it. I didn't even not know what it felt like because even in the cave, I'd go down and I'd get my ice cream. It takes a couple weeks before all of a sudden it hit me. 
and I started being able to breathe. My head cleared up, my sinuses cleared up, and once I realized, so this is what it feels like to breathe without snorting and coughing all the time. Man, I am so excited that if you offer me ice cream, I say, oh man, I like breathing, no way. There are benefits, and so praise God. I mean, I am just so thankful that I got the victory in this department, but the same dynamics that I struggle with are real in our lives on something that is a lot more serious. Some people, maybe it's not ice cream. Maybe it's alcohol. There are people that go to church and they go through the motions of being a Christian and they've got an addiction to shopping. They, they can't control it. They do it for comfort. It could be some drug. Some people sit at the computer and they're addicted to other things. It might be pornography. And it's like you live a secret life. There's a lot of different ways that it plays out. Jesus doesn't just come to save us in our sin. He comes to save us from our sin, and he can. And you'll have a peace and a joy when he does that's unlike anything you can imagine. Romans 6, verse 12. This was our memory verse. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Now, God didn't say that we're never going to stumble and fall. He says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. What he does say, though, is sin should not reign over you in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being one alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Jump down to verse 17 in Romans 6. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more un lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for holiness. And he goes on to say in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, if you look up higher in the same chapter, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 10, all things are lawf lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. You might even find something that inherently may not be bad, but it is out of balance in your life. And it's taking up your time. Some people, they are addicted to a TV program. I know it's hard to, for us to understand it. Sometimes the things that tempt you may not tempt me. You might laugh at what was a problem for me. So oh, you got a problem? I don't understand it. But it's not your problem. It was my problem. Who knows why? But those same people, I know people that are Christians. A lot of them. And at a certain time, every day, they've got to be where a TV is or they tape it. And they've got to watch a soap opera because they've gotten sucked into this artificial... Now, I laugh at that. I cannot understand how people will look at these actors going through these bizarre things on TV saying, oh, no, was it with her? Yes, it's with her. Oh, but did you kill him? No, I killed... And they're going, oh, they're crying and they're watching all this. I've tried to give Bible studies to people who... They got the soap opera on, they say, oh, just a minute. Oh. And I can't take it. I can't understand it. But it gets a hold of them. And their lives revolve around that program as my stomach turns, or whatever it's called. And it takes over their life. And for most people, it's not an issue. Now, I don't know what your pet temptation is. We're all different. Some of you are Peter, some are James, some are John, some are Mary. Some are Martha. The devil knows what it is. And he wants to get a hold of you so that it controls you, that it, so it becomes the defining influence in your life instead of Jesus being the one who's in control of your life. And at some point, the first step is you gotta, like I did, you gotta say, this is out of control. I got a problem. And Lord, I need your help. And it's not a good witness. You know, when um, up in the hills near our cabin, 
uh, we've got a few trees that are, are nice looking trees and I was out walking one day and I remember seeing that this poison oak vine was beginning to go up a rather picturesque oak tree up there in the hills and I didn't think much of it. Now usually poison oak, it just, it just kind of crawls along the ground. It's not very big or it might get up in the manzanita bushes a little bit, but they are vines and unencumbered, they will continue to grow and they get pretty massive. And a few years later, I went walking by that same tree and I noticed that the poison oak vine had wrapped around and was going up into the tree and it was creating a lot of weight on the branches taking over the whole lower half of this very big majestic oak tree which normally would be very strong and independent. And I realized that uh, something had to be done or it, when the snow came it was going to, the weight was going to take that tree down. All it took was chainsaw and one cut and I knew it would die. Um, even though I made the cut, the vine was still hanging there. But I wasn't worried anymore because once I knew I made the cut, it was going to die. And sure enough, as time went by, the vine rotted, rotted, it blew out of the tree. The tree continued to flourish and stand strong. Some of us know we've got tendrils and they start small in our lives, but they'll continue to grow and wrap themselves around your life and start sapping the strength and distracting your energy and your time from what God wants you to do. Now, I'll interpret your silence to mean that maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you know that there's things in your life that are out of balance. It may be something that is outwardly is harmless as ice cream. It may be something more serious. It might be a, a serious substance abuse or practice or relationship that is unhealthy. And you need to say, Lord, I can't do this without your help. And you come to Jesus and you confess that you need supernatural intervention and the Lord can give you the victory and you will rejoice. And, and it is so nice when you can look back and say, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. It is so nice to know that thing doesn't have dominion over you anymore. It's not controlling and defining your life. He wants you to have that freedom and that experience.